they took back this space and wanted to participate in this uh, political system. Now, of course, this is not our topic here, but one of the consequences of that revolution was that it was a dream, although this dream was transformed into a nightmare, but this doesn't mean that we need to stop. We need to repeat it once, two times, or maybe three, or maybe ten times until we can realize our dreams and have a space for citizenship, for rights, for diversity, and for differences. Our discussion today, in a way or another, is one of the consequences and impacts of what happened back then. Maybe what we want is to have a theater, to have a space, and we need also space for our body, we need dancing, etc. But the main question remains, where is the place for the individual, for the Arab individual, where is the place for the individual in general, but specifically for us, where is this public space? How can we reclaim a part of this public space? And who is taking this public space of us, whether it's urban, whether it's the citizenship space, and how can we bring it back? How can we appropriate it again? Maybe through the struggle or through the struggle for citizenship. So allow me to present to you our speakers. We have Abira Saksouk. She is an architect and an urbanist. What's nice about her experience from my perspective is that she used her experience as an architect inside the theater, inside the performance in the city. And through a dictaphone group, they had really important experiences. I don't know if she will speak about them in detail, but we have something related to Delhi and how to defend uh, the Rauche and the shore of Beirut. And I think that Mona al her colleague, whom I'll present later on, also speak about that from her point of view. And this is actually uh, a sample at, about what we're speaking about, about the public space. So this is one of the lungs of our city. So this is something that will be seized later on, although this was a place for a public space for our citizens. Maya al is a researcher and a writer, a feminist researcher and writer. She worked a lot on gender. I think that your presence with us will enrich our dialogue, especially about the body of women, about women as a right, about women and the right within the group. I would like to bring your attention to your thesis about the uh, different uh, movements in Lebanon for feminists, and I think it's very important, and you're also in the uh, feminist observatory and uh, media in Lebanon because we see it as very patriarchal, meaning the media. Thank you very much. But maybe this is another topic for us journalists. From Egypt, from Alexandria, we have with us Muhab Sadr. You are in the heart of this topic. You come from Al Madin Fungu Adaiya wa Rahmiya for performance arts. And this is one of the independent groups. When I used to know more about Egypt, back then there was one group. And I would like to greet Hassan Great, they had back then Al Warsha Theater or the workshop theater and I would like to greet you and greet Alexandria today. You work on reclaiming the public spaces in your way and we will be able to speak about this today. Mona al I spoke a little bit about your experience. Mona has done a lot of things and she's still continuing. For us, you are linked to Barakat Building in 2002. This is how I was introduced to you. I went to do an interview with you. People said you were crazy back then and they, no one believed that a Barakat Building will become a building for collective memory. That was your bet back then and you 
won, and uh, you are also now the campaign to save uh, Dalit Araushi, and you, Adolf Azam Salam, who has written Amar Beirut, reconstruct Beirut, the last opportunity, and he was the first one to defend public spaces, and he was able to see through the Hariri vision and say about how it is eating our public space. And there are many things, of course. Now, of course, everyone knows that I like Morocco a lot, uh, but you participated in many things in Beirut. Tufi, is it you? Is uh, to my right. They had the first group for modern dancing in Marrakesh in Morocco, and he's now the director of the International Festival for Modern Dance. His band is called Anania, and for those in Lebanon who like modern dancing, of course, have uh, seen them in that festival. If we look at the body, the body, whether it's collective or personal, it's considered as a part of the public space, and it's something difficult to where uh, traditions are prevalent. And when we speak folklore, we speak also what is classical. But uh, really, what you're doing is a revolution by itself. And uh, at the end will be with Raquel Fortwong. I hope that I spelled it right. Uh, the, um, what's important here with Raquel, of course, she's important in many aspects, but I would like to focus on two things. First of all, that she's coming from the other side, from the north, and she will help us to see ourselves through their experience on that side of the Mediterranean. And Raquel is a producer, and she focuses on artists that take uh, spaces that are not traditional, that are not conventional, and she has uh, worked with people who are very important in the theater. And she focuses uh, on finding the alternative space, the non traditional space, and this is what gives the spectators their space so that they can participate in the show, they can criticize, and they can voice their opinion. I hope that I was accurate in my presentation. Raquel. So I won't be long anymore. I would, I would like to start straight on with Munar Halak, who will show us some of the elements that she used to defend the, the memory, the heritage, and the public space. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me here. I will start with an experience uh, that we're working on now. This is Beirut. This is Arausha Rock. And you can see the idea. I will tell you about something that happened in 1999. It's about the relationship of people with the space, with the city. There is a Palestinian artist, Nasser Sumi. He participated in Ashkal Alwan in a show on the Cornish of Beirut. And in two days, we told people that there is a French company that is trying to cut a Rauscherock and to put it on a floating body so that we can take uh, this rock to other countries, to London, to, to London, to Thames, to the Seine in Paris, and to other water bodies. And back then, they were still working on the reconstruction of Beirut, when, where they destroyed 90% of the downtown, and people were seeing this happening, and a lot of people were speaking about the debts that we had. And we told them that this deal will help us pay our debts, and then 10 years after that, we will bring back the rock. Believe it or not, I stayed there for two days doing interviews with people. I didn't tell them anything. They came there. They saw that there were people trying to cut the rock. And they asked me what, what was happening. So I told them this scenario. So they started inventing other scenarios. They said, this is Hariri inventing this because he wants to remove the rock and build something else instead of it. So why doesn't he build something on the rock? Or why don't he put something on the pavement, build something on the pavement, then link it with a bridge to the rock? So we had like different uh, kinds of scenarios. And this is something documented in a video. 
and only few people refused this. Even the Polaroid uh, uh, photographer said this is the last picture of the rock. So people actually accepted that this rock would be cut to bring us money. On this basis, in 2014, the daily of the Rauch, meaning that this is the last part that wasn't yet organized. So we saw that a fence was put around it. And until now, it's subjected to be occupied and used for an urban development. Hariri bought this land in 1995. Although this is a big space, for citizens because it has important geological characteristics, archaeological characteristics, because this is one of the most important places on the geological level. It's also considered as being important on a, an, on a biodiversity level. It has many plants, uh, many animals as well, and uh, there are also small caves inside, and from there you can see the whole city. So it's a way for you to see the city, or you can see it from the city. So although it has all, this char all these characteristics, and although it was always privately owned, it was always used as a public space for diving, for swimming, for the different uh, occasions, uh, for the Wednesday of job, and uh, for the Kurdish uh, people here in Beirut, and for Norak Day. And, uh, but two years ago, we saw that it was being prepared to be transformed into a resort, a closed resort, only for the elite or for the rich people. And as I said, Beirut is on the Mediterranean, and people cannot go to the beach unless they pay money, except for the places that we have in this daily and uh, it's unaccepted to have this fence on the shore forbidding people from going to that place that they always consider as a place for them to interact with the beach. Abir Sa'su is one of the people who started this movement. So this is a gathering of people that are interested in the city and in reclaiming the open space, the public space. So we started the, this campaign and we've had activities for two years. We told them to stop their project. We've had many artistic uh, programs there. We interacted with the people over the fence. We used kites. We had a competition as well to have future, future designs for this place without affecting it. All of this so that we can stop this big project. We've had also visits from schools for adults and for children to know more about this space. And we've had also a popular movement after the garbage issues. So the youth themselves went there. They removed the fence. And they liberated uh, this space from this obstacle. After that, we went to the World Heritage Fund, and we and this place uh, have become observed under this fund in uh, New York. And the Ministry of Environment only participating in proposing a draft law to protect this place. But until now, but until now, we don't know any of the plans in this regard of course, because of all the political pressure. The second example that I will give you is Barakat building. This is another space. This is the yellow dot. And you can see it with all the urban chaos that we have. And next to it, you can see Sama Beirut Tower. It's called Sama Beirut because after that, we won't be able to see the sky of Beirut. I discovered this in 1994. Uh, this building was on the borders that uh, during the war um, 
the borders between uh, West Beirut and East Beirut, so this was where the borders were. So it was open to the sky, open to the city. And this is why it uh, can interact with the city in a transparent way, in a very nice way. You can see the sky from inside. And you can see how it interacts with all the city. So because it was on the borders, the snipers and the fighters occupied it, and it had become a killing machine. So they used it. They used this location to uh, snipe and to kill people in the city. And they used their own architecture inside the building. In 1997, they wanted to destroy this building, as they did with many important buildings. But because of the media campaign because of many visits over 13 years I was able to get to a decree so that this building would be appropriated by the municipality of Beirut and be transformed into a museum but it's been until now five years that we are trying for this building to have a cultural policy and a cultural content but the municipality with all the contradictions that we have they paid 20 million dollars to restore the building but they didn't accept to pay only one million for the cultural content. So we will always have this debate to get to any kind of culture through public policies. Now I will end with something that's happening now. This is the uh, urban evolution of uh, Beirut. You can see the real estate uh, speculations that were able to separate the city from its shore. So they want to go higher and higher. And this is uh, the only sand shore that is public in Beirut. And also today, it's facing the risk. It faces the risk of be, being privatized in the future. So there are many laws that are being manipulated so that the private ownerships become even more important and take exceptional uh, measures and use the public spaces and then forbid people from getting to the shore. You can see this, this is just next to this uh, sand shore and you can see there the boats, uh, the least expensive one costs uh, 200 or 300 hundred thousand US dollars. So my question here, and I will end with this question, this is Raml al Baida shore. What I want to say is, are we doing enough, really, are we doing enough to reclaim the public space and the open space so that people, all people, can interact with the city and with art, especially people that cannot pay and go to the theater and or to artistic performances? Are we doing something so that people can feel again their citizenship and their belonging to the city? within all the problems that we have, all the emptiness that we have in our institutions in our country. So in this framework, people will always do their own transgressions that are small in the public spaces. You can see this guy jumping from the corniche to the sea because he cannot pay money and go to one of the resorts. So what we need to do is to increase our intervention so that people can still interact with the public spaces and open spaces and link city, the, the city to the public space. Thank you very much. Thank you. Without any immediate relationship, but uh, Taufik, can you talk about your perspective from Marrakesh? You studied architect, actually, but then you worked in theater, and this is how you got to dancing. I think that you'll be speaking in French. So what is public space, and how can we reclaim it? Thank you. My name is Taufik Isidiou. I'm a dancer and a choreographer. I'm interested in the pedagogia. So two or three years after starting uh, dance, 
I started working on this pedagogy because whatever I have done, I have done it against my will. This is why I decided one day to switch to dancing, and then I decided to be chore choreographer because there were no other choreographers, so I needed to dance, but I needed also to find a choreography for myself. So I invented myself as a choreographer. I have a dreamt about a group, but I didn't have enough dancers, so I needed to train dancers myself to be able to have this uh, play or this dancing group. There were no uh, festivals or meetings between dancers and choreographers in Morocco. Then one day I have called upon them so that we can meet all together. And this is what led to the festival that we have now. It's been 12 years that we have this festival. So I'm also the director and the inventor of this festival for 12 years now. I think also this is the case of many choreographers and cultural actors here in the Arab world. Even before walking, they put a big burden on our back and they tell us to run. This is why the festival in Marrakesh is called En Marche. Walking, but here by this, we mean that walking means also that we will fall down and then we will use this foot and that foot. So it's about learning how to walk. This is why we named the festival En Marche. And dancing in Morocco is still taking its first steps. Let's speak a little bit about the public spaces. One day in 2005, I don't want to be long. I'll try to be as brief as possible. So in 2005, I was in a coffee shop in Marrakesh, and I was thinking to myself, but what can we do so that people will know that there are contemporary dancers in Morocco and are participating in events all over the world, and they are presenting Morocco in a very good way. So this is how I had this idea of blocking this roundabout for a certain time. But I know very good that the government and the system with all the policemen, etc., will think that I was going to do some kind of a buzz. And I didn't know that if it would really work and really be able to improve the world of dancing. So I said to myself, let me be intelligent. Can we stop it for one hour? If I do stop it for one hour, what can we do then? So here I had like a thousand of questions. Which dancing? Contact dancing by itself is a scandal if we do it in front of the public. So we needed to create a new interpretation for it. And this is how we invented a new interpretation of our dancing because we didn't want to have something copied from others. So we said if we were able to block this roundabout for an hour. This is already a very strong action. And if it's important that we benefit from it. And But I thought that, unfortunately, maybe the people who came from the left and from the right will consider that we were crazy. So we tried to use a traditional, uh, traditional music. So we arrived there to the roundabout, and we wanted for one hour to walk along this roundabout with traditional music, but they only gave us a small portion of this uh, roundabout at the last minute. And until now, the permission was only an oral authorization. They didn't give us uh, like a paper or something solid to be based on. So that they can use it later on against us if need be. So, anyway, in this space, we have calculated it and it contains 100 steps. And until now, this project is named 100, almost 100 footsteps. 
So we're working now on the 500 steps, 400 steps. There is also another story about the public space. We grew up with uh, obstacles and barriers. For example, whenever there is um, a meeting for the council, then there are barriers. We cannot barriers. We cannot go past them. So for the first time that we went to the public space, we also put obstacles and barriers between us and the public. Now it's been 10 years that we work on the streets. The first time we put 40 obstacles. Now we put only eight and uh, some ropes between the obstacles. So I wish that one day would be able to put nothing between us and our public. So there are many issues in this regard, many topics and many laboratories. Of course, we will get back to you later on after we listen to the questions of the audience. Maya, it will be your turn, please. I know that you don't like any authority, uh, especially the patriarchal authority. So could you please just speak about the public space from your perspective? Hello. Along the axis of capitalism, privatization, securitization, and then the public space. And then I'll end on a more positive note. I was jokingly telling a friend a few days ago that Beirut is a big construction site in process, a simple act of iterating the visitor. But the truth of it struck me massively. Beirut is a construction site. And capitalism, not only as an economical system, but also a system of domination to space, occupied our everyday. Capitalism privatizes as it moves, colonizing the lands of the city, its parks, its trees, and everything, like our, even our visual appetite. Okay? And private spaces become occupied by companies and then highly co uh, populated with private security guards that racially and class profile people according to their own rules. Take Sanaya Gardens, for example, if you have looked into it. The problem with capitalism is that it does not confine itself to being only an economical system, but under a highly policing, authoritative regime such as Lebanon and the, in the urban in specific, these regimes feed into the capitalist limitation of mobility and creative art. So how is art and mobility connected? The concept of mobility and creative art might be very far away from each other, but the commonality between them and what glues mobility and public space together is the idea that mobility, similarly to creating art in the public, are both highly policed. In order to create art in public spaces, you need to be mobile free. Graffiti is still illegal in Lebanon, especially if it's unauthorized by the state or any other state agency. It is perceived as vandalizing of public spaces and walls. So how do we express art in the public while it's illegal to spray the walls? And how do we create art? Take photography, for example, music or movies. If at one point you are in the streets taking photos of a street, a building, or anything like something that looks appealing to you, and a civil dressed army or police member approaches you to ask you what are you taking photos of, or even confiscates your camera, and sometimes even detain you for further interrogation. Policing itself connects both mobility and art in the public space, sadly. In a country that was mostly overruled by bombings and always so scared of terrorism, the state found its exit to making its securitization more visible through spending more police, through spreading more police in the streets under the claim of protecting its citizens. Military bases are in many places in the country and many stories have been told about graffiti artists and photographers and movie makers getting detained. On another note, we have to mention that gentrification 
colleagues on the panel have talked about, taking place in most of the Beirut neighborhoods. And the constant erection of phallic shaped skyscrapers all over the city, while they are being advertised as the luxurious modern world, that are literally, while they are literally erasing all the cultural, architectural heritage of Beirut. In addition to swallowing alive all the old buildings, and that is done by either paying big loss of money, or small loss of money, or by coercing the people who live inside this building to actually leave. Similarly to the public and private space, similarly to the like, public space, private spaces are not safest places for women to co coexist with the rest of genders, especially cis men. Sexual harassment had and have been used historically and temporally as a tool of, in order to assert male dominance over public space, subtly, directly, or indirectly, asking women to go back to the private. These theoretical claims manifest in the details of the everyday lives of women and those who subvert from the normal gender expression through harassment in the streets, in public transportation, and even inside one's own car. If you look around in the public, it's very rarely to see women sitting in the street doing nothing. This is a concept called loitering. They cannot sit in the street just because they can. Women are mostly always on the way somewhere. There is always an aim, an end product in a Marxist sense, that need to come out of being in the public. Go to work, go to mall, go to wherever you want, drop your kids in school. We always have a mission in being out in the public. It's rarely to see women in the public just because they can. One of the reasons is harassment. The other is the social morality apparatus that kind of tailor our lives. Take, for example, jogging on the corniche. Day and night, whatever you are wearing, whatever hour it is, you will most likely be harassed. And this is what I mean by male dominance. It's the act of asserting a space as male-dominated space through harassment. Also, not to mention that if you ask for protection from the police, they mostly will harass you as well. The listed above are not only the problems in the urban public, but I choose those points because they highlight the intersection between the public, race, class, gender, and capitalism. It is rather frustrating to speak about public space. Sometimes, I think after maneuvering the public space in Beirut, I get home and I need a group of people to give me a standing ovation. Congratulations, you have yet survived another day of stress, harassment, traffic. Watching the memory and the history of the city being erased by gentrification, watching the public populated with people begging in the street in order to put food on their table because the government does not give them their basic human rights of food and water. Dealing with the police, the intelligent men, dealing with men spreading in public transportation and men staying in conversations and men interrupting, and then dealing with the visual distortion where Beirut turns into a big parking lot for cars, the garbage spread all over the country, and the noise pollution, and what have you not. The problem by stating, starting to figure out solutions to those problems and social paradigms that led to them is that we tend to always think of direct answers. It's like an equation. So we have this problem, we have to solve it. But then again, it is a big leap to only get from one, which is the problem, to the end product, which is the solution. So I'm here going to just try to think with you and a couple of questions of how to really think of a, a safer public space. How can we think of a public space that is harassment free without increasing the level of state policing in it? Also, how can we think of loitering for women as the right to the city without taking that right out, away from other chapters. How do we talk about the male dominance in Beirut? Because of construction work, without demonizing construction workers. How do we break the stereotypes about the working class as harassers, while we all know men in big fancy cars harass as well? Police and army members harass as well. How can we think about the safer public space without reproducing the same state narrative that uses the alibi of protecting its citizens, never its migrants or refugees, 
by imposing more policing on public spaces and, and counter-public spaces as, as a tool of control. How do you think about fighting the gentrification in our cities and neighborhoods without allowing it to cripple us with frustration? And how do you move into the details of resistance without being overwhelmed by the bigger picture of how powerful capitalism is and how powerful those who build their capital on it, the ways of economy? How do you fight those and resist them? How can we still build communities that are interested in political mobilization while those communities feel constantly policed? Well, you can never trust a stranger because of, from our experience of political mobilization, especially and specifically in the most recent resistant movement, the Eustic movement in 2015, that some of the protesters joined the movement, like joined the groups, the meetings, the resistance, even the protests, and pretended in their civil dress that they were kind of like protesting civilians, such as like uh, similarly to all the people, and then turned out to be intelligence, mem intelligence members that detain people eventually. So how can we build trust again in a public space that is constantly regulating us through surveillance? How do we as well think of mobility as citizens that is inclusive to non-citizens while municipalities are spreading the country with curfew signs for refugees? And how do we mobilize against it without giving the state more reasons to impose more curfews? How can art become inclusive and emancipatory to all marginalized communities? Most importantly, I need to reiterate here that the most dangerous part of not having a public space or public space in general becomes a limitation for communities, especially those who are politically organized, to grow and organize as a mode of resistance against oppression. That said, it is to be acknowledged that yes, graffiti is illegal, but most of the walls are sprayed with often very strong statements that are political, which are important for social discursive shifts in any social paradigm. Yes, harassment happens to women, but women did not retreat from the street. They are still there, and they hopefully will always be. Yes, gentrification is erasing the face of the city, but there are people who are fighting day and night against it, against erasing away the heritage sites from Beirut before the Civil War. I'm not trying to paint an image that is contesting to what I have said before. My point here is to reiterate that wherever there is oppression, there is resistance. And whenever there is resistance, positive change can be achieved. achieved. The question is, how do we resist against all those factors in the urban without becoming oppressors ourselves to other genders, classes, races, this is the main question I will leave you with. Thank you. Rakel, the other question is, how can we explain how we can explain the fact that 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 Thank you. Um, well, as an observation, more from what the previous two speakers have said, I think some of the issues that Northern and Western European artists face are actually very similar to what I've just heard. Um, what I would want to add to that is to say that there's a very long history of artists working in public space, which a lot of us here are very familiar with. Um, but ultimately, it's all about ownership. And I think the ownership of space has become a very politicized and a very um, capitalized issue in the last 20, 25 years. When, um, in the 1960s and 70s, when lots of artists in, at least the ones that I know about, in the UK and in the Netherlands and other areas of Europe were um, looking to radicalize public space by taking back a sense of ownership of the streets um, there was also a similar strand of work working in the public space as well from much more conceptual artists who were looking at it from a 
more of a kind of um, abstract form of recognition. So I think those two strands of artists, and particularly performing artists working in public space, is still very present in contemporary work, but the, 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 the frameworks have shifted so that um, some of the artists I work with now have become, it's become increasingly difficult to work in those areas. It's, it, it, if what was originally seen as being, um, let's take over the public square and reclaim this as a place for proclamation, has now become, uh, well, the public square isn't the place where the proclamations could take place because it's entirely um, capitalized by advertising, by uh, pub private ownership of what were previously seen, or at least perceived as being public spaces. So that's very similar to what you were saying earlier on about the coast. Um, uh, and I think there's also a kind of um, nostalgic romanticism of this idea of the public space that artists are still kind of um, to some extent suffering from in that, that it, it's free, that it's speaking to the people, that it's engaging with the people. And I would um, maybe provocatively like to suggest that I don't think that's always the case. I think that quite often in North and Western Europe um, it's less provocative to go and engage with people on the street in a random way than it is to actually try and uh, exchange in a dialogue about what art means and how we uh, live in our world together. So that's in a very short nutshell a kind of response to what has been said. Um, the thing that I'm particularly conscious of in my work is that even in a country like the Netherlands, which is a very liberal and very open uh, country, even the, the outdoors, even nature, has become so highly regulated that it's almost impossible to actually try and make work if you're wanting to make work outside of a theatre. And a lot of the artists I work with, and many others here, are more interested in engaging with other spaces, as you said earlier in the introduction, because it requires a different response to art, it requires a different response to what you're experiencing. Because artists like those are interested in engaging with the public in a meaningful way, which isn't coded by the same conventions that a plush theatre or a uh, concert hall or an opera house will do. Um, but if we can't even work in found spaces because the regulations are so extreme, if we can't even work in a park because there's too many uh, uh, permissions that you are required to do and most of the time those permissions are so extremely expensive that it's really only possible for a very large event organiser to, to work in there for very high prices, then where does that actually leave us? So while we may have the advantage in the north and west of Europe of having had uh, maybe 30, 40 years more experience of working in public, I don't think we've gone very far. I think in many ways we've gone back and it's become such a highly charged space here that I'm not entirely negative about it, but I think that we have to really challenge how we understand those public spaces. And if, if what we're really interested in is having an exchange and a dialogue with the public, then perhaps the space isn't the only thing that's important about that. And there are other ways of doing that. Okay. Um, I think it's a very important the idea came out uh, of the artists because they wanted to go to a work to interact in the public space and uh, the, the artists are uh, we uh, have uh, some uh, uh, some pretexts uh, or uh, some things that uh, they want to think about when dealing with the uh, with the, uh, the media of the 
or the public space. But the idea came is or the revolution uh, made us uh, familiar with the, some issues, uh, and we, the idea was that we have to go to streets not to educate or uh, let uh, the audience learn, but to have new ways of expression. So we started with El Madina project with the training, uh, street training. Uh, it started in 2011 and until 2014. The idea was the following: we as the artists, we will have to go to the streets and to have uh, workshops in the streets with um, uh, the participation of the public. And as for the square, for instance, and we will have to convince people to interact with us in, this, in these workshops. The majority of the workshops were uh, conducted by uh, trainers from Europe, from Egypt, and from all around the world. And the idea was that the, uh, the population will have to uh, participate in the productive phase in order to get rid of the stereotypes uh, related to the, uh, the elite or the luxurious uh, life led by the artists. We uh, led 18 workshops in the streets. All the uh, performances were uh, generated from ideas uh, submitted or presented by uh, the population. They also participated in uh, training workshops. After the training workshops, we uh, had training workshops in modern dancing, in clowns, in multimedia. We worked as well over the past three years on 18 workshops and we have worked in Alexandria. We focused our works in Alexandria afterwards. In 2015, we had the street carnival, uh, the objective being to exploit all the cumulative experience that we have gained throughout the, four, uh, the past four years in addition to capacity building uh, led by 140 artists in street workshops. The idea was uh, to have a different way, a mode of production. This uh, mode of production will be based on empowerment of minorities uh, present in Egypt. The idea of having Bedouins, uh, Azidis, and uh, religious minorities, minorities and others. So the idea was not to present the problem uh, generated by the minorities, but to uh, tackle the positive uh, side of the minorities in order for uh, the population to be defending these priorities instead of us being in a, a position to defend uh, these minorities. The idea was to go to the streets and to uh, spread joy uh, through this carnival, to uh, have uh, interaction with us through dancing, through singing, and at the same time the values uh, that we embrace, i.e., the non-discrimination and uh, the uh, sexual uh, and the defend, or avoiding sexual harassment, harassment were uh, really stressed. On in 2015, we have worked also in Morocco with African refugees in Palestine as well uh, migrants, sorry, and in Palestine and Syrians in Alexandria on concerning the uh, sexual harassment. The idea was to select the topics that are conflictual in Egypt. We told them we have uh, local cultures or some minority-related cultures that can give some solutions and the marginalization. It's not the solution. We have to uh, take from them the values that are able to f uh, solve some uh, confessional uh, or the, the issue of uh, minorities in Egypt. Uh, and actually, we are working on uh, some theories that are translated into practice with uh, different types of minorities, and we are trying to work more on this issue. I want to sh uh, shift to the last uh, stage, which is the uh, street theater in Egypt. This was a campaign launched in the beginning uh, of the year. The idea uh, was to work on two main uh, goals. The first goal was to fund the, uh, the, uh, the theater, uh, the street theater, and second, to work on laws organizing artistic work in public space.
We have worked with 12 uh, organizations uh, working in Egypt from different provinces, from organizations having uh, continuous production in public space. We launched two studies, one analytical study of the needs and difficulties faced by these organizations, and the second study conducted was a legal study the, that revealed that none of these 12 organizations or associations had two bylaws related to uh, the artistic work. So, the, uh, the laws that are adopted in order to, uh, to arrest, for instance, uh, some artists in the streets was the, uh, the demonstration law. So none of these 12 association, associations uh, were aware of these uh, laws. We had some persons or some artists trying to be granted some uh, licenses in Egypt. In Egypt, we have to take uh, these uh, licenses from five or six uh, authorities, and the, majorities of, the majority of these authorities cannot grant uh, the, those permits of those licenses, uh, licenses uh, in case there is any problem. So they will be sanctioned if they uh, give their approval. The, so let's say, OK, they have, uh, uh, they are grant, uh, they grant us oral permission and not a written one. We have, uh, the law is, uh, is really uh, differently implemented in Egypt. It's uh, sporadically implemented. So you are dealing with a certain uh, issue on a case-by-case -case scenario. We have also merged uh, these two, two, two studies in a book with an infographics on uh, each one of the organizations that participated in the survey. And we launched a campaign on Facebook, the campaign uh, aimed at targeting uh, the audience and not the population of the uh, state or the policy makers in order to uh, tackle the issue of uh, uh, field uh, of street uh, plays and street theater. We had some arguments in order uh, enabling us to uh, deal with uh, policy makers in terms of the benefits that can be generated from the uh, street theater. So the solution is that you have to focus on funding and on uh, amending the laws in order to find solutions to many problems. So the f we focused on uh, raising awareness of the public concerning the uh, street theater. Let's say that you do not have any problem with, uh, with this kind of uh, theatrical uh, or, fi or uh, street play. I think that we have to convince you in order to facilitate the laws related to uh, the street theater, be it on uh, an economic or uh, political, uh, from an economic or political viewpoint. We are currently working on a strategy in uh, entitled SOAP uh, strategy. The strategy is to uh, go to some streets, some, dis uh, some districts, in order to choose some public spaces to uh, launch uh, artistic uh, activities or cultural events. And the idea behind it is uh, to let these districts benefit from uh, the artistic uh, or cultural uh, events. We have worked in a highly marginalized area in Karmuz. And the idea was how to change how the image of uh, these marginalized streets and to uh, let uh, these, uh, the population in these uh, districts to benefit from uh, their artistic work and cultural, uh, through these cultural events, how can uh, they change the image of uh, the, uh, these, mar these marginalized uh, and the reputation of, uh, of these marginalized streets. We have established a map of each street or each district in order to enable the artists to go to the coffee shops, for instance, or the artistic shops. And we will also have a, an, artistic, uh, an artistic intervention concerning the uh, uh, heritage and uh, the stories that we collected from the population of uh, these districts.
I think that I have covered all the events related to the public space in Alexandria, and I have copies or versions from the uh, study that we have conducted. Thank you, Wahab. Abir, you will be the last speaker. Abir Saksuk, you, I think you have a presentation. Right. You have a presentation entitled Hada Al Bahar Wali or the sea is mine. So is the street still mine? You have to answer this question. Thank you. Today I'll present to you a project that, that was done by Dictaphone, but it's not Al Bahruli or the Sea is Mine. It was Mashid Ali work, so that uh, I show you this. It was in Saida. I chose to speak about this project because through it we can ask a few questions related to reclaiming the public space and how it's related to what we're living today. Dictaphone Group works on live performances. This is based on uh, urban researches, so they take the audience to the place uh, that the content of the performance speaks about. So we take the audience to that place not only to watch the show, but also to interact with the space and build a memory with it. The title was Masjid Dali, come so that I show you. And it was workshops with uh, young people from Saida, and the idea was public spaces in Saida. Why did we choose to work on Saida? After the project Al Bahrili or the Sea is Mine that spoke about all the laws concerning Beirut shore, and we took people on a boat from Alim Reise and Terrier. So we thought it was necessary to work also outside the capital where people are facing the same challenges and to ask the questions in a different way that is more pertinent to the space where we are. If you see a side of from an aerial photo, it's clear what the problems were. You see that the shore is uh, being uh, landfilled and you see also another port that is being created for the yachts and uh, there they are actually burying what was known as Iskandar Bay. We have used different photos to show how the city was used before. It was a necessary step not just to create a nostalgia towards the past for the city, but also to uh, show how people used to interact with the city and to confirm this relationship, this close relationship for, uh, between people and the city. Here this was called Bahr al Eid or the Sea of the Eid of the Feasts, like uh, the, what we had before in the woods of Beirut. So the sea is between the old city and the shore in Saida where people used to come and uh, use the swings. After that, we started looking at the map of Saida to see which historical old locations people in Saida had relationships with, although a lot of them disappeared. So in the first phase, each participant chose a location in Saida that they had a relationship with. And we worked on that, on them, on a research for each of these locations. So we had seven different locations, and we started thinking about what really affected these locations in Saida. It was clear that the highway that was established in the 90s separated the city in two and it destroyed Bahr al -Aid, or the Sea of the Feast, and uh, it separated the, the city. So the participants had to do a research, see how people used the space before and how they use it now, and what allowed others to destroy these spaces. And finally, the seven participants presented seven shows 
each of these shows had a different title related to the problematic of the location. One was called On the Valley, at the shore, Alexander Bay. And then these shows were presented on a land for the municipality at the entrance of Saida. You can see that it's surrounded by a fence, it's neglected, but people still go there through a hole that they created in the fence. We chose the space because it represents the entrance of Saida because people arrive to the city and there we wanted to introduce them to the city. This is why we call this Masjid Dalik or Kamsa that I show you, so that I show you Saida, of course. So uh, we worked on preparing the space, on arranging the space uh, so that we could have our shows. And uh, we did it on a Sunday so that it's more like a carnival, like a festival. So we had an interaction with the unexpected audience, not necessarily the audience who knew about the show, but people who used to go there to look at the sea or to swim. The seven shows happened in different places in this place, but I will highlight one of these shows. It's the show that Abed worked on. He's one of the participants in the workshops. It was about the sand shore in the old city. What we found out through the research we discovered that the sand shore, when first the French distributed real estate, it was all public uh, spaces. But then in 1948, these public spaces on the sea, on the shore, were transferred to the municipality. So this change of ownership that is actually illegal and here you can see the surface that is hundreds of thousands of meters that were transformed to be municipal after they were public and this uh, law was created so that uh, this uh, hotel Tanis Hotel uh, would be built in Saida because when the municipality has the ownership, has the deed, then through co contracts with the public investors, the municipality can give them the land to build whatever they want. And this shows that this change in politics is not just due to civil war, this is actually an economic uh, policy. This is a way of looking at development since the creation of the Lebanese state. Tanya's hotel was destroyed during the civil war because of the Israeli invasion in the 80s. And the location is still empty until now. Then we saw that there was also another amendment in the law. And we hear a lot now in Saida that uh, this hotel will be rebuilt. And since the municipality owns the real estate, they are preparing for a bigger project, much bigger than Tanya's hotel. And if you remember the aerial photo, this is the only space that is still open to the sea now in Saida. So Abed has done this research and he called his presentation a hotel by the sea with an interrogation mark. And the interrogation mark is important because Abed worked on like redesigning the lobby of the hotel. You can see it here. And the audience comes and sits with him around the table and he speaks about the new hotel, how it will be more glorious than the previous one, how it become a private place, etc. So he started interacting with the audience and he was confronting them with something that could become a reality for them. And the discussion was sometimes contradictory because many people in Saida today want to go back to the glorious days of Saida and for them Tanya's hotel was a part of that glorious past. So some of them were defending for this place saying that no we don't want something new to be built but some others were saying that we we cannot say that the hotel cannot be built because some people really want it. 
and we were trying also to be more active on the level of the research and arts so that no hotel will be built there on the, on the shore. Maybe this project led to many important questions. When we speak about nostalgia, about the past, about going back to the Lebanon that we knew before the civil war, civil war, to which past do we want to go back? Is it this past? Because it's also a part of Lebanon's history, meaning transgressions, violations, and this economic policy, or is it the other pictures that we saw in the beginning when we see history from the perspective of people and how they decided to use these spaces them, themselves. It was something important because when we see sites speaking about old Beirut or Beirut heritage, there is always a return to pictures and symbolism related to the city before the civil war and it looks a, a lot like what we are trying to defend today. And the other part is related to the different roles that the artist, the researcher, the activist or the resident in the city can play. Where comes the difference between us voicing what the people want and also the residents and the city maybe they're convinced in a certain perspective for development based on what the state said development is. Maybe development for them is having a hotel and making people work in the hotel and then they will have more people coming to hotel, to the hotel and Saida because not so many people go to Saida. So I wanted to end with these questions that could uh, help us in the later on discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Abir. How much time do we have? 20 minutes. So please, uh, those who want to take the floor, please put your hands up and please tell us to whom your question is addressed. Yes, Hassan. Microphone, please. <laughs> Although we worked in uh, theaters and in our spaces, we have worked actually in a loft and the heart of Cairo, but despite that, people considered us as being a big space and they considered our relationship as strong with the street it's as if we couldn't go out of the loft but the street came to us thanks to the spatial relationship that we created with people through our topics then when the revolution started so what I want to say now is related to revolution First of all, in the street in Egypt, we have a very high dynamic. So our street needs a special kind of work, or else our street will eat this work. I have seen in Al-Mayadeen and in Alexandria different kinds of uh, theatrical work, but uh, the spaces absorbed and devoured uh, these works uh, and they looked first at them with uh, the generosity but at the end they were stronger in their daily life they were stronger than the show or the play and the strongest thing that happened in Egypt was Maidan al-Tahrir Square once I went there 
and I had asked a lot about Mawarid uh, or resource and I think that hundreds of thousands were there in al Mayadeen so they were really affected by the ambience that was there and we saw a lot of intimacy in Tahrir Square but after it was emptied so days after it was emptied I saw someone who had written an Egyptian uh, saying, I don't know if you have it in your countries, saying that when you're lucky or the hour when you're lucky is an hour that will, that will not be repeated again. And also this uh, luckiness is intimacy. So I, I saw this. Uh, actually what I saw is in front of luckiness is a ban because in Arabic it's hath and tather. Uh, so I work a lot also in Germany. This is why I wasn't able to be during the revolution the whole time. But many people from those who we have trained started doing something within the revolution. And some of them adopted arts that they used on the Cornish. And it's one of the oldest Cornishes in Masr, in Egypt, Almenia. Uh, Cornish, and they decided to go to the soldier who was there, to address the soldiers who were there, because there were soldiers protecting the building of the governorate. Of course, they didn't know what his quality was, but they decided to take a statement from the soldier. They told him we need to do a show here on the Corniche. Actually, they wanted a permission from So they, he told them, you are now doing a revolution, but you want my permission for a show? So, uh, so this has happened, actually, in Egypt. This has happened in a very specific moment. Thank you very much. Hanan. <laughs> This panel is very important because it uh, mixes research to activism, to citizenship, to arts, to artistic uh, performances, to feminism in a very organic way. I would like to thank really everyone. I will not have the time to ask deep questions to all of you. I could speak for hours with each of you, especially me. This panel was really important for me, but there was a word that was repeated, and it made me sometimes curious. It was said by a lot of you, and it was implicit for some of the others. You spoke about nostalgia and the public spaces. The presence of Raquel is also very important with this panoply of uh, Arab and regional artists. Then Abir said that it's not just nostalgia, it's to speak in the language of the people and how they see their history, how they see their life, and how their life was a square for joy and for love and for feeling their own existence. So I don't know how it is possible for Raquel to explain this uh, nostalgia and what is proposed now. This is really problematic and I think we should shed the light on it more. Is it addressed to someone in specific? Yes, it's because Raquel mentioned it, uh, Abir as well and also the perspective of Maya is important to me. To complete uh, what Hanan has just said, I have a question. This was actually mentioned, but maybe we can widen it even more when it comes to war. So construction and reconstruction or destruction and reconstruction. As a Syrian, I see my whole country being destroyed. So I saw all this coming, but your role is very important. And now you are carrying all this burden of reconstruction and all this pressure of war. So while war is happening, what can we do, which measures can we take, which preemptive measures can we take so that we don't reach this phase where a lot of transgressions are done? So what 
what can we do? I know there is no magic, but can we do something really strong while we are preparing for the reconstruction that will contain a lot of greed, transgressing the public spaces, demographic uh, destruction, etc. Thank you. Let us first take the questions, then each of you will take the floor to answer. Mono. I have a question and a comment. My first question is to Mona. You spoke about the uh, Barakat uh, building in Beirut. You spoke about a figure of $20 million that were paid by the municipality of Beirut in cooperation maybe with other funding partners. And what is the relationship or what is the reason why the municipality uh, refused to pay for a cultural uh, policy for this building? And are there any ways of alternative cooperation, maybe with the Ministry of Culture? I don't know that maybe it's not under the prerogative of the ministry because uh, the building is owned by the municipality. But have you thought about other ways for funding this cultural policy? because all people are waiting for what will happen in, this building, in that building since before 2012. As for Abir, speaking about our relationship with the public and open space and then the relationship with the authority since the beginning of the Lebanese government here, I have an observation. I don't know if it's correct, but all the public institutions that should be a part of the public space were not made by the Lebanese government. For example, the public library. The public library, actually we're still waiting for it to be reopened. It was created based on an individual initiative by Alfred Tarazi in 1921. Then we had the tramway of Beirut that was made by the Turkish. The same goes for the National Conservatoire. So I don't know if we can generalize this idea that the interests that we had were not actually there since the Lebanese government or state was created because they had other interests that is uh, dividing all the pieces of the cake. So that was since 1948, so I have uh, 1943, so I have this uh, questioning. I don't know if you agree with me. Thank you, Mona. Any other questions, comments? Because I would like to give the last word to the participants. Yes, ma'am. Um, I can't listen and hear at the same time. Uh, you probably read Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine, which is exactly the same as you're talking about. After a war, or after a tsunami, or after a disaster in any country, uh, it is a capitalist thing. They come, they're moving in, rebuilding many, many cities and local people from all, all over the world. They're no longer allowed to get to the sea or the water sources or anything. So I thought it was fascinating. But even even in our own city in London, which we have not been suffering like you have, squares and roads and, and whole areas of London are now privately owned. So if you want to do a project there, you have to get permission and you often find the, the, uh, the, the company that owns the, the square is far away the other side of the world. And it's, it, is a, it is a huge problem we should all be... All be I think it was really, really interesting. But thank you very much for the really good panel. Thank you. Hello. 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 Well, just to go to back to what you said, there was one point that I said to what the discussion about was this morning about censorship. So increasingly, I think that the public are becoming censors of how arts can be performed in public space. 
and this is a particular problem for Western Europe, in that um, some of the more radical and conceptual ways in which artists are engaging in public and in a public space is about questioning those issues of ownership and questioning those issues of, of who spaces it anyway. Um, and it's often the public who are saying, um, we don't want this, um, and looking for it to be banned in some way. So even in Western Europe, which is liberal and open, etc., there are lots of issues around freedom of expression and uh, the ability to express yourself. But in, in, in response to some of the other points that were made, yeah, I think that nostalgia is a problem for, for Western Europeans. I think that there's a, 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 a I, I think that there's too much of a harking back to how it was before as if that was better. Um, and I think that that's an issue that artists have to engage with in a more exciting way perhaps than just simply seeing the public space as being um, the area where it's possible to be public. So I think people be public in other ways and engage them in other ways, which doesn't always have to be harking back to something that was better before. أنا كنت حابب بس أقول على فكرة إن يعني إحنا بقالنا خمس it's been five years that we're working in this uh, theater in the streets and now the institutions or the groups that were working in that uh, have some of them have disappeared some of them have stopped of course we have the problems the funding problems but we have also other problems because uh, actually it's the state that pressured the uh, funding uh, entities to stop giving money to these uh, groups and there was an aggressive treatment of these affairs and the public space and we see that is it's the Baltagia that are doing this so if you go to do a show or in the streets or to draw something on the walls they tell people that this is a problem so what we're trying to do now is to help artists not to stop working in the streets and all the institutions that started doing this we are encouraging them not to stop because then progressively the street theater will disappear from the public spaces that's it what is your reply to Hassan that says that sometimes uh, the streets uh, can devour the show of course there are different levels of artworks in the public space and even if the street ate the theater play this is also something important now if we have confrontation from the people or of, uh, there are other things then I think that even this is a good plan even if the people ate it and I think it's really beneficial for us as long as we can stay there for four years uh, there was there were political altercations between the governor and the head of the municipality and there was something also personal in politics so I won't pass uh, this project for you because I don't want you uh, to be to get all the credits and uh, all the credit front of the people then with the new governor we discovered or this is what I think the building was being completed and it was something wrong to have it completed without its content so now they're afraid about what to put in the building how will we deal about it? all the different things that are said about it how will we work also on controlling what will be put there so in an implicit way we're working on a way so that the public funds are not exploited wrongly so now we're discussing this with the governor and uh, since uh, the mayor of Paris will, is visiting we we're working so that we will have in a few weeks a legal structure for it so let's see if it will really happen unfortunately the building belongs to the municipality and the money also comes from the municipality and the inhabitants of Beirut from the tax money 
This is something that I think always about when I see my Syrian friends and I take them to Bet Beirut or to this building. Yes, this danger is coming to you. This danger is imminent for you. And here there are two concerns. The first one is archiving. Because you will see that many things have disappeared. There is destruction before the war and in the aftermath. And you need to raise the awareness of people about reconstruction because it can be dangerous if it doesn't take the social dimension into consideration. And downtown in Beirut is the example about that. You need also to raise the awareness about the importance of uh, pressuring for their and lobbying for their rights. So imagine that they w would have accepted uh, to cut the Rauscher Rock and take it elsewhere. So I don't know what happened uh, in Syria during the war, but there is uh, there are things that you could do. I will start now <laughs> with nostalgia. I see that a lot of things that we work on. There is always a focus on a focus on history, and we say that returning to the past is not just for nostalgia. It's also because it's clear in all our struggles that there is always a question about our history. How was it written? And what is the, the image of the city? The whole time in our head, we wanted to have old pictures of this place to see how people used this place before, where the authority and the official entities showed the Delia and the Rauche only as the rock or the hotels that are that were built in the 60s or the new cars that we see on the modern roads of Rauche. So why the officials only show that? And this is the modern picture that is not related to people that live there, to the people that use this territory, to people that bring their their food and eat there and in the space on the floor. So there was the struggle to show the history of our city and this is the alternative history and this is what is essential, not nostalgia itself. What you said, uh, Mono, I think here there is something very clear related to the economic policy that our country was built upon. So Lebanon in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there were many public projects done by authority, but these projects were only made to serve this economic policy based on tourism and services. So laws were made to establish highways, but they didn't use the money for popular units of residence or for creating public spaces. No. The state wanted projects that only served its interests and the interests of the merchants uh, that started the state and they didn't care about the interests of people and the economics in general. And now I will end with a proverb also related to gender and to see how sometimes uh, but women's issues uh, are used for privatization. In the 60s, there were a lot of projects, and 60s means before the war, so there were a lot of projects like resorts, private resorts, and the Jnah, Sassimu, and Uzai. And if you look at the different uh, magazines that were written in French back then, all the pictures were pictures uh, of uh, girls in their bathing suits, saying that finally women can now go to the beach. And this class of people that back then was able to put these bathing suits and go to resorts were only used as a justification to establish these places and then later on to close them. Mm-hmm.
I would like only to add one thing to what Abir said. Sometimes the Western press tries to use the women or the presence of women as an exception. For example, in the demonstration, in the demonstrations that we had in Lebanon for you think movement, there were Western journalists doing interviews with women and asking them, how do you feel about being here in public demonstrations? And actually, as I remember, after 2005 demonstrations, the feminist movement were, or had most of the demonstrations done more than the others. So they had a lot of demonstrations before this movement, before you think movement. But I think that the, the Western journalism tends sometimes to externalize, exceptionalize the presence of women in public, although they're all over the place. But then about the nostalgia question, I think that we are stuck in a stagnant uh, position about the 70s. I know from my parents when they speak about the 70s and people who lived back in the 70s, they would say everything was nice, we had public spaces, but if you think about it, if it were really like that, would, do, would we have had this uh, civil war? Because this is related also to sectarianism, so this is the point about nostalgia. We always go back to the past only to focus on one point because we don't have a history. Everything was removed from our city. There is only maybe this building that will become a museum for war. So it's not something that is taught in our curricula and in our schools. We always stop our history on the Second uh, World War so that they won't speak about civil war and then they speak directly about the Taf agreement. So and the, it's nice that this is the, not the objective from these pictures. The objective is to show how things were before. That's it. One more point. We know that in Beirut, Yes, there is surveillance, but also in Europe and in the U.S. So I think that surveillance is something uh, global with uh, neoliberalism. That's it. This is what I wanted to say. So Beirut is not an exception to this uh, liberal system where everything becomes surveilled. Thank you. A microphone, please, or else I can't translate. I just want to say that there was a new research about Damascus and Aleppo linking the the conflict to urban planning. And I think this is a preemptive measure for the conflict that could also start other than this conflict, and this is also related to uh, justice and urban planning and how it can lead to conflict itself. Thank you. After all these uh, topics uh, about freedom of expression, dancers, and the public space, I think it's uh, worth sharing something with you. In the last edition of En Marche, in March, we had many contemporary dancers, and it was uh, organized by uh, a Hasin organization and our company, Ananya, and we created our first 
manifesto for dancers in Morocco. I will read it for you. Maybe it will give you ideas. I don't know if this was done in other Arab uh, countries or if this can inspire you. So I invite all artists and dancers in other countries to do the same thing to uh, pressure the Ministry of Culture because they have the money so they need to give it to us so that we can do our work and so that we stop asking for money from here and there. So thank you. This is an official statement for dancing in Morocco. So dancers, choreographers, artists, uh, the audience and the citizens in Morocco, we all seize the opportunity of this 11th edition of the International Festival for Dancing in Morocco to call upon all the institutions and institutes. It has been 15 years of creativity. It's been 15 years of uh, exchanging dynamism and uh, knowledge through individual works that led to the syndicates. And we have had festivals So it was a really nice uh, dynamism where all the actors worked through individual actions that were able to improve professional uh, groups and create an international festival. This has also contributed in, the, in giving a very nice image of Morocco. We were, were aware of what happened lately in Morocco, of difficulties related to dancing and artists. There are also other disciplines, as you know, but there are no tools of exchanging knowledge. There are no places for work, and there is also more creation. This is why all of us amateurs and uh, professionals in dancing, artists, academics, uh, the audience and the citizens, we demand that you recognize these institutions in Morocco through having a cultural policy to support dancers and choreographers today and tomorrow in the training, creativity, and publishing of their works, and also in, in creating strategies for them so that they can have good performances that are economically viable and you should have always a dancing education which will allow the individuals and the groups of working more and uh, creating better dances. Thank you. So we will end with this uh, manifesto. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank the IETM once more. And we wish you more prosperity, dialogue, and success. Thank you.